Welcome to Dream Farm. On today's episode, I'm going to take a look at everything that we've planted on the farm within the past nine months. And let's see what's growing and what isn't. What can we learn from the stuff that is and isn't? I mean, it's, I try to learn something every time I, I do something on the farm, whether it works or doesn't work. There's quite a bit of stuff that seems like it didn't work this time around. So we'll get a chance to see some of the things that, that went wrong. I was out earlier today and went from field to field and uh, checked on all of, the, all of the projects we've done, the tree plantings, the acorn planting, uh, the food plots. And uh, anyway, I thought you would enjoy the update. It's been rough, you know, throughout a lot of the Midwest with this drought that we're having. And it's hit us pretty hard here too. You're gonna to see that in some of these spots. And we'll have to talk about what does that mean for the future? What does that tell us about some of these spots where you know, maybe it doesn't make any sense because it's too um, sensitive to dry conditions to plant certain things in certain areas. But if you look behind me, you're gonna see one of the few successes. This is that field that uh, we call the scrape tree. I think there's about three and a half to four acres of corn behind me. And it's doing really well, but it's down in the bottom and uh, the deer haven't really started working on it at all. I mean, you got you know, some really nice six foot tall corn. So we should get a nice crop of corn out of this one. Uh, there's one other cornfield that we've planted that seems to be doing okay. But uh, a lot of the stuff that deer really like, the things that they like to eat during the summer, like peas and beans, uh, Boy, that stuff is just getting pounded. It's just growing so slow that the deer are just eating it to the ground. But uh, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. Let's jump in and see what's happening on the farm. Dream Farm is brought to you by Whitetail Institute Food Plot Blends, The Hunt Stand Pro Whitetail App, Hoyt Archery, Wildlife Farming, and RTP Outdoors. So this is how we're gonna make the farm pay. They say that these recreational farms that you can't cash flow them. If you don't know what this is, I'm not gonna tell you. But if you do know, you know what I'm talking about. Dry it down. It's the good stuff. <clears throat> We're in the spot, one of the spots, where we planted the acorns back in early November. I've been keeping a pretty close tab on how well uh, those things are doing so I can show the viewers kind of that process. This spot behind me, maybe an acre, maybe a little bit less, there's almost no oak trees coming up in there, just very few. I think it was because the, the ground was softer here when I was disking the seed in and I wasn't feathering the disc to flip over, you know, only like three inches of dirt over. I was just dropping it. So I think they, they planted too deep. My guess is that the ones in, in this area behind me were probably, you know, six plus inches into the ground. They may still come, but that might be too deep. So as we go further around this point, you're gonna see more and more of the trees. I think it's not only that, uh, the fact that you know, the ground was a little bit harder so that when I disked it, they went in shallower. But also it's facing more towards the south. They probably got a little bit more uh, sunlight, more heat. So they might have germinated a little bit better this spring. But I can see quite a few more in front of us. It's just something to keep in mind. I'm going to always pay attention to what works and what doesn't work and try to figure out why something either does or doesn't work so that we can all learn from it. I think they went in too deep. This is one of the spots where we planted the choke cherry and the plum. I want to look at those trees because just going by on the lane here, it looks like they're just holding on by a thread. I'll probably, I'll probably need to start watering these, which I was trying to avoid that. I've got a big 200 gallon sprayer, three point hitch sprayer. that has got a spot sprayer nozzle. 
So I could go around with that and I could, you know, hit water onto a lot of these trees, but let's take a look at them. So you look at this and the deer aren't, the deer aren't eating it. It's just dying, you know, a little dead leaf. Um, it's just not getting enough water. And there's a bunch of them along here and they're just kind of hanging on. Look at, here's another one. It's just kind of hanging on by a thread. Uh, we'll look at some more, but probably if I don't water some of these, they're just not gonna make it past, you know, the next couple weeks. So I'm gonna go behind me. I'm gonna show you, these are choke cherries here. I'm gonna show you a plum. I don't like the fact that the top of these twigs are snapping off. This is a plum. It's still alive. I mean, you can see, you know, it's still green, but like I said, we're just within a short period of time if we don't get rain where these are gonna start really to stress bad and die. So here's another plum. You can see this one looks a lot better. The end of the twigs aren't dead. There's leaves coming off the top. This is just in a little bit better dirt. So again, it might be location specific, maybe on a really nice wet year. Some of those spots that are really intensely south facing might do better. It'd be nice if they got a root down because once they get a root down, then they can probably survive a lot more. So the, again, the stuff in the better dirt looks like it's doing better. Unfortunately, I asked the forester if there was something that I could spray to kill these thistles without killing the trees. And he said, no. So all I could do is just manually clean up around these trees. Maybe I'll do a little bit of that, but that just sounds like an awful lot of work. So that's another plum that's doing pretty well. Uh, overall, I think I should say that the bare rootstock planting has been successful. Like I said, some of it's getting to the point where it needs some help, but it's only in those really extreme spots where the soil is really thin, kind of planted into clay, really aggressively south facing. So I'm gonna count the bare rootstock as still a viable success. We need to look at the red osier that was planted on the upland spot. I know the stuff in the bottom, we could probably go take a look at that too, it's behind that cornfield, but uh, that's doing pretty well. The stuff that was growing, that we planted on the slopes, that wasn't in like wet, wet soil, uh, that stuff is really struggling too. So we'll take a look at that uh, next. This was one of the spots that I uh, drilled in with the no-till drill earlier this spring. There's beans in there, but gosh, they're really short. You know, I think it's a combination of not having the rain to get them to germinate and kick off because even no-tilling, I no-tilled it into pretty dry ground. And we haven't had much rain since. I think the deer too, they can stay on top of beans like this if it's not growing fast. It's really easy for them to take a bite and move on and take a bite off each plant and the plant never gets going. Whereas if it grows fast and gets up, then they take a bite or two off it and the, and the plant just keeps going like it's nothing. My guess is I'm gonna have to either completely till this up and start over with uh, brassicas or drill, probably drill brassicas into the beans. Uh, that decision will come in just a few weeks, you know, when it's time to plant those. Uh, White Hill Institute has a couple of different brassica blends. I'm gonna use the winter greens quite a bit I should probably have bought like a pallet of, of winter greens because it's, there is so many of these fields that are just like this, that are, you know, they're probably past um, saving, but we're gonna have to rescue them. And, and the way to rescue them is either with something like cereal rye that grows fast uh, or the brassicas, which you get a lot of tonnage, which is why I like them a lot better. So we're gonna go look at that spot where we did the goat prairie. I shouldn't say we, 
the guys from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife did it. But uh, we'll see what's growing in there. It's cool to see what happens when you remove the canopy, what comes in. There was a timber rattler out there last time I was up here, so I'm gonna have Ethan go first and then I'll follow. So the headline reads, young Northeast Iowa cameraman <laughs> dies of venom. Rattlesnake bite. <laughs> Him. Well, it looks pretty good. We're not going to spend any more time out here. I mean, it does need to be burned still, but it's a lot of vegetation coming in that wasn't here when the whole hillside was covered in cedar trees. So that was a definite uh, win for the farm was taking those cedar trees off and allowing this you know, native vegetation to come back in. So I'm gonna introduce behind Ethan is Carson Christensen. That's how you pronounce it, right? That is, yeah. He's gonna be an intern uh, for Bowhunting Whitetails this year. So if anything looks bad and doesn't, you know, like maybe it's below standard, Carson did it. That wasn't anything that Ethan or I or Jordan did. So This is that ridge field that we called the rainbow field because when we diagrammed it, there was so many different things growing in here that we put each one in a different color and looked like a rainbow. It's not a rainbow field right now. It's a kind of struggling corn, sorghum, clover, and power plant field. There's pumpkins planted along the edge too. So we're gonna look at all of it. Uh, you can see the sorghum is coming in I came back and drilled sorghum into the spots where the corn was failing, which was probably about a third of the area that I had corn in here. And again, this failed because of the drought, because the deer weren't really pounding this and they still haven't started. The corn didn't do well because it just didn't germinate. So then now it's starting to pop up, but the you know, plant's not tall rather than you know six feet tall. So let's take a look around. This middle part, this was planted to... Uh, the Whitetail Institute Imperial Whitetail Clover. And it didn't get the best of, of uh, love from the weather either. But I think if we mow this down and check this again, you know, closer to fall, I bet you there'll be plenty of clover in here. This edge over here was the power plant. And that should be beans, peas, uh, sun hemp, and sunflowers. And there's a little bit of that stuff coming up, but gosh, it's just, these ridge top fields are the worst because they just don't get that much moisture to begin with and then they just get pounded by the sun. Uh, it just kind of makes you sad to see, you know, what could have been and then what is. So let's take a look. You can see this is where we planted the pumpkins. I can't remember how many little hills we put in. There were 300 seeds. So we probably put in, I don't know, 75 little hills. But we'll walk along and we'll show you how they're doing. They're doing really poor, well, they're growing but they're way late. They're probably a month, six weeks late because after we planted them, we didn't get any rain. So it'll be fun to see if they do make it to maturity and if they do, uh, how our deer react to them. Everybody talks about pumpkin as being maybe a delicacy to the deer that's super attractive, but if they've never seen pumpkin before, it might not mean too much. So uh, yeah, they're just a fun experiment, but they're finally growing but we may find long term that if it's going to be some kind of grain here it's going to have to be sorghum or long term this might make the most sense just to be alfalfa because that's very drought tolerant and the deer love that for you know most of the year there's only just a little brief period during the winter when they're not in the alfalfa we had a lot of failures on the farm this year so i'm gonna have to get in there and, and rescue a bunch of these plots the ones that did the worst were the ones that the deer loved to eat during the summer not surprisingly the beans, uh, anywhere I planted beans, they, they uh, pretty much got eaten to the ground. There's a few here and there, and maybe with some rain, you know, we'll get six inch tall beans in some of these plots. But it's nothing like you would have normally if everything would have, you know, happened correctly. I'm gonna drill uh, winter greens, White Hill Institute winter greens, into these plots. That's a brassica, 
which means it's like the turnips, you know, the, the forage, rapes, forage, um, radishes, you know, the, the, anything in the brassica family. I like those because you get a lot of tonnage. And the deer, in my experience, have done really well on that during the winter. I've had good success hunting over their, those spots, you know, into November and then clear through the late season. Cereal grains are an option. I've planted cereal rye quite a bit over the years, and I will probably uh, plant some of that in a few spots. But for sheer tonnage, it's really hard to beat the brassica blend uh, like winter greens. So two weeks from now, two to three weeks from now, uh, that's gonna be my job. It's gonna be uh, getting those planted. So I'll be back on the tractor here pretty soon, and uh, we'll bring it all to you along the way. Well, we appreciate you joining us. We'll see you right back here again uh, in the near future for the next episode of Dream Farm. And remember to always dream big.